Welcome to Speaking Cinema, serious movie jibber jabber, a movie podcast broadcasting to you from Liverpool, England, via Hollywood, California, planet Earth. We are Speaking Cinema. We talk about a movie before and after seeing it for a contextual conversation, but the only thing fit to podcast movies. Oh, what's that? You heard that there's other podcasts other than more things about movies? I never heard of that. Fuck those podcasts. Listen to us Jibber Jabber every single Monday, so try to tune SoundCloud, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Tumblr, at Speaking Cinema. I am your host, leading the British Invasion, Mr. Jibber Jabber, hosting with me here today, as always, Kevin, a.k.a. the Fifth Beatle. That's me. This is season 11. All I want for Christmas is rock and roll. Woo, woo, woo! I look at rock and roll documentaries. We could have went two ways with this. Idea one, rock and roll documentaries. Idea two, rock and roll movies. I'm talking Blue Hawaii. I'm talking Help. I'm talking Hedwig and the Angry Inch. Talking all those talks. We went with the first one because chronologically one becomes four two. So next year probably do rock and roll for Christmas. Yeah. The narratives this year, documentaries. Um, why you ask? This was Kev's idea. Kev, credit to Kev. As we were trying to put together a list of Thanksgiving and a playlist for Christmas, my anemic lists were met with uh, with Ke- Kev's look of just uh, like uh, just complete n- indifference. Just, just, just you know, there was this sense of like uh, you know, like nobody, apprehension. Nobody wanted to do it. Yeah, it's and like we already did Christmas stuff, right? Kind of. And there's Christmas, there's Christmas horror movies, and there's like Home Alone. And those are all fine and good, but there's a lot of like Thanksgiving, man. It was that was hard. That is slim picking. And so Kev just looks at me and he says, "Let's just do the rock and roll season." Sold. Do it. Uh, because rock and roll, in its various incarnations, is my favorite kind of music. Kev, I know you're a fan as well. Of course. I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you're more diverse in your musical fandom than me. I think you you kind of uh, sway all over the place. I have a very wide swath. Of music that I'm interested in, mm-hmm. I have eleven thousand five hundred songs mm. in my uh, personal a, playlist. A variety of sonic a noises. Variety, I like soul. I like rap. I like country. EDM. No house. Uh, that's about the only thing I don't have is mm. the is the EDM bullshit. Mm. Everything else though, I'm pretty fair game. Mm-hmm. Got some folk. Got some metal. Got a little bit of everything. Yeah, I think on a previous episode, uh, I. Uh, I put the exclusive love of hard rock over all genres on you. This is a note from our corrections and omissions department. <laughs> they uh, let me know that. So I think I think it's not. I think I said that, and it's true about me, but not about you. No, which I am that way. Do I gear more towards it? You know, I'm always going to gravitate towards a band with two guitars, a bass, a lead singer, a keyboard, and some drums. Mm. Like, well, I'm key, all, that I'm extra guitar and there. keyboard, interesting. <laughs> you know, I want that full sound, mm-hmm. I want that big sound. Sure, but, uh, sure. This world, it's too big to only listen to, like, one genre, so I always try to Mm -hmm. expand my horizons and find new stuff all the time. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we're gonna, we're we're, we're correcting our our mistakes, we're getting rid of the holiday movies, save the Halloween ones, because Halloween is obviously the best holiday holiday with the best holiday movies, because there's entire subgenres of movies that take place on Halloween, movies about Halloween, just horror in general, but everything else... For the birds. And I think uh, with these rock and roll documentaries, I really feel it fits into our format because rock and roll and cinema have been like bedfellows for so long. Mm-hmm. Like filmmakers are obviously into rock and roll, like Martin Scorsese, Jeep Jarmusch, they make rock and roll movies, documentaries. Mm-hmm. And then rock takes a lot of inspiration from cinema. You see music videos that are completely based off Clockwork Orange. You see references in lyrics and in playing and mm-hmm, you know metallica's mm-hmm. opening music is the ecstasy of gold from the good the bad and the ugly right so it, it's they've always kind of been intertwined and mm. so for me it's they're one in the same almost mm-hmm. yeah and it's i thought it'd be a great way to explore that on this podcast so what do you what do you think of the state of rock and roll music and music in general you know what i mean like everybody always says oh rock is dead man nobody's playing rock and roll anymore it's like rock and roll is never popular. It's never the thing that everybody's listening to. Other than it's, in like the fifties. Exactly. It's you know, and that's just because we were all horny teenagers and we had to get something out. But it's always lived on the fringes 
and it's there's so much good stuff out there this idea that oh yeah it, it just is died and reborn it's like it just never really goes away you kind of get waves of like the garage rock revival in the early 2000s and then there was the dance rock and then you know there was um grunge obviously it's they kind of hair come metal in, hair metal arena rock they kind of come and go in waves but they're always there they're always on the fringes and if you can't find a good rock show it's your own fault I agree with you completely. I I think that there's never a time, and this is not true for me and you, and I'll get into that in a second. There's never a time like your childhood where things you're discovering things and things mean a lot to you, and it's like, you know, I'm sure that if you grew up in the 70s, yeah, you could just go to your local wherever music was played, and every time anyone came, you'd go. Like, there'd be, like, fucking Boston and fucking, you know, all these other, all those bands in that genre, and you love them all, and they're all great. And same with hair metal, right? It's like, Poison, White Snake, Metallica, you know, all these people came, Anthrax, you know, and you love them all. And that's totally fine. Now, rock is not dead because we grew up in the, and again, I'm not nostalgic from my childhood, the worst time of music. <laughs> the worst time of music, which was? New metal. New which metal. was? terrible now but boy do i ate it up sure uh, about you? well this is right as the internet was cracking right so it's like you didn't you really didn't know any better so all you had was blink 182 on the left and corn on the right and limp biscuit also on the right yep. and um and then you discovered oh the for me it was like the misfits exist this yep. is amazing but yeah and that's as like frowned upon as that music is it did end up being a gateway to a lot of things sure you, you see like papa roach you see papa roach but yeah he's wearing a fucking stooges t-shirt you're like who are the stooges yeah you're looking at those liner notes that was back in the day where you'd buy an album oh, yeah. and it, you needed that booklet because you need to know who they thanked yep get because... those liner notes and then yeah you want to figure out who the butthole surfers are and then you go find the butthole surfers and the butthole surfers lead you on a grand journey mm -hmm. san antonio's own butthole surfers and you know so so there's that so i think there's that element and if you want a band that rocks right now against me is a great band that's out there that's a, a band of now ghost is a phenomenal ghost. band of that's a band of now rival sons is making waves out there who uh who are those people who open for motorhead crowbot crowbot that's great and crowbot's a lot of fun too like mm -hmm. ghost is fun against me is fun but not like funny like you know like well it's against me has that edge of like she she mm -hmm. is now she's transgender she's right so they're, they're making this big statement right they're holding the flag so that's your statement band yeah. but if you want your fun fun just let's have a good rocking time crowbot crowbot all day their new album welcome to fat city just came out not too long ago and, by the way and by the way they have an album called welcome to fat city it tells you everything you need how to know how can you not love that band <laughs> and uh you know also when you, also in the state of rock and roll if rock is dead it's like well I mean, I guess people begrudge this, but it's like, you know, you got like the Rolling... Like, what was that? They had Old Cella. Old Cella, yeah. You know, the Rolling the Stones. Rolling Stones, Roger Waters, The Who, Neil Young, Bob Dylan. These dudes are all still out there. So when we were kids, I feel like your MTVs and your VH1s and your other outlets of medias were making fun of the Rolling Stones. Like, because famously, Mick Jagger's like, I don't want to be playing these songs when I'm 30. And he played them at 30, 40, 50. Well, actually, he said quite the opposite. Oh, did he? He was on a, a talk show when he was really young, when the Rolling Stones were first just blowing up. And the guy was like, what do you, what do you want to do after this? And he's like, I don't want to do anything after that. I want to keep going. He's like, you want to mm, be on stage perfect. when you're 70 with a cane? And he's like, sure, why not? And then they show him on his 70th birthday. He's like, well, he doesn't even have the cane. But he's still on stage. You See, know? and I love it because... And I, I've seen the Rolling Stones live. They're incredible. Well, that's the thing. Like, listen, if... Like, there's just... I I don't know... Then I don't know who said that other, the, other, that other quote. Someone said that. I mean, there's, you know... There's plenty of people that have said that before. And, and that, you know, it's like... When it comes down to it, if, if anyone in this world... Fuck the politics of rock and roll. Fuck rock and roll. Let's just talk about life. If you find something that you love... And you truly love doing it... And as you get older, you can you can you can still do it. Fuck. Right. What else is there, right? If the Rolling Stones are playing a concert and they're playing to, you know, packed houses and people want to see them and they're giving it you a show and they like doing it, nothing's wrong there. Seven yeah. years old, dude. That's cool. Cool as hell. And I think I, the, I think the Onion had a great headline. It said, 
Look at this washed up rock star doing exactly what he loves. You know. <laughs> and it's interesting. I think the Rolling Stones, Lemmy, and Alice Cooper are those old guys who like they never really changed, and they're just like, listen, we're gonna do this forever, and fuck everybody else. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, and I respect that. Exactly. It's like just. It doesn't matter if you're a rock star, if you're a teacher, if you do accounting, if you still want to do it when you're seventy, and you can still do it. Why not? Do it. You know, yeah, some bands aren't meant to last. Like, you know, fucking uh, the Smiths, right? We, yeah. You're lucky you got those many years. Yep. But, you know, I don't know. I think it's cool. Speaking of bands that didn't last very long, but were highly influential. Oh, uh, I don't know what you're talking about, but this time on the Jibber Jabber, the woman behind the Beatles, 2013's good old Frida. Kicking off with the biggest band that ever existed. I'm not going to be so bold to say ever existed, but possibly will ever have existed, right? In terms of just sheer popularity and world domination. World domination. The Beatles are unmatched. We'll, we'll get to this. We'll get to this. I want to watch this movie and then talk about this. But it's like the Beatles are a brand like... Kleenex. Beyond, but like Coke, Disney, and the Beatles. Are, it's a, a brand that is synonymous. It is... Like Superman, right? It's like everyone you, knows. You can hold that up anywhere in the world and someone will raise their flag and go, oh yeah, mm-hmm. that. Good old Frida, directed by Ryan White. Writers Jessica Lawson and Ryan White. Starring Frida Kelly as herself. herself. Documentary. Produced by Tripod Media. If you're not familiar, Good Old Frida tells the story of Frida Kelly, a shy Liverpoolian teenager asked to work for a young local band hoping to make it big. That band? The Beatles. As the fame multiplies, Frida bears witness to musical and cultural history, but never exploits her insider access. The, uh, their loyal secretary from beginning to end, Frida finally tells her tale for the first time in 50 years. That synopsis comes to us directly from IMDb user Anonymous. Thank you, Anonymous. So normally we'd introduce, like, the movie, right? Yeah. But... When it's the biggest band that's ever been the the cultural phenomenon, Kev, I say let's just talk about our personal experiences with this band. We've never seen this movie. Uh, missed it when it came out three years ago. Didn't yeah, know it came I out. Did not see it in theaters. So let, let's talk about the Beatles. Let's, 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 uh, let's begin the conversation with movies. Have you seen any of the Beatles movies? Yes, I have seen A Hard Day's Night. Mm-hmm. Um, I've not seen Help. And I have seen Yellow Submarine. Mm-hmm. I have seen none of those. None of those. I highly recommend A Hard Day's Night. That is just a very fun, buoyant, like everything everything you'd think about a charming Beatles movie would be is A Hard Day's Night. It's, it is an, just a fun little film. It has a Criterion DVD all to itself now, too. I do want to check it out. Mostly for my dissatisfaction of Tenacious D and The Pick of Destiny. I, I'll defend that movie. I enjoy Here, it. Here's it's my fun. here's my problem. Here's my problem. In the world of Tenacious D, in the world of Tenacious D, they're the biggest band in the world, right? Exactly. They're metal lock on the list. Yeah. Okay. And I'm down for that. And I love them. And I and I think that they that that's a funny thing. Okay. So then, Kevin, explain to me how it makes sense that they can make a movie about how no one knows who they are and no one gives a shit. It's their, like, origin story. Uh, they become. But that's, like, but... I, become, listen, I've never seen this Beatles movie, but is this Beatles movie about how they're just four ugly guys that no one thinks are cool yeah, and they gotta convince everyone? They're at the height of Beatlemania in A Hard Day's Night. So it's just them, like, running around and then they'll, like, hide in a barbershop and then they do a little bit in the barbershop and then they gotta run from girls again and then they See, take a train. That's what I wanted. And, that's what I wanted out of the okay. Nation Team movie. Right. I wanted a little bit more Phantasm. Also, one of my favorite lines... He deactivated from, lasers with his dick. Come on. That, that was... Come on! Also, my favorite line from that whole movie is, I'll take the fried chicken and the steak, and I will also have a chicken fried steak. <laughs> I like, uh, we have a song, it'll turn your brain to shit. That always makes me laugh. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, here's the thing. I was writing this little format that we're uh, going off of, and I realized that everyone loves the Beatles. And everyone gets their love from the Beatles from their parents, right? Who are just whatever. My mom never, ever played the Beatles to me as a kid. Um, from what I gather, what she likes, she likes them casually, right? She's, like, not against yeah. them. 
But I think, you know, she's, she's kind of secretive in her nature, in her narrative, right? So I think she was rocking Janis Joplin in her 74 Toyota Celica. <laughs> um, this not confirmed. But highly suspect. But highly suspect that that, that was the A track rolling around in that backseat. <laughs> so did your parents play you the Beatles? Like, how did you get into them? My parents listened to a lot of... I remember it. My mom had a lot of Paul McCartney solo albums. Mm. And so that's where I kind of learned, like, oh, who's... Who's Paul McCartney? And she's like, oh, he was in the Beatles. And then the big breakthrough was when that Beatles One album came out. Yes. Had, like their 20 number one hits or whatever. And I mean, that just reignited Beatlemania. And then that's where I really learned my aunt was a huge Beatles fan growing up. And so she had like this Beatles book. And that's kind of when I really started to discover um, the Beatles and who they were. And then when they released that remastered box set, I went and bought it. So the, I, bought the Beatles in mono? I bought the stereo one. Oh, you sold out. You not, sold I'm out. You sold out. I'm a sellout. But, um, so yeah, I own every Beatles album. And that one includes all the singles that weren't on albums. So I have every Beatles song in my collection. So would you say that you like them? And by like them, I don't mean like them in the, like, how we all like Coke. Yeah. I'm talking about, like, you listen to them by yourself. I do. They're, as someone who plays guitar and is interested in the songwriting craft. Their songs are so perfectly put together. And then when you learn them, they're using, you know, their songs sound very simple, but then when you really dig into the nuts and bolts of them, they're pretty complicated little tunes. Hmm. And they're just very, like, certain little guitar runs or chord changes are very tricky. And they're deceptively complicated songs. And it's that's that's really fun it's always hard to find that mix of anybody can listen to this and dance and think it's a great song. But then when you try and actually play it and if you try and rearrange it at all, it's like, it just doesn't sound the same. And you really get the feeling that Lennon and McCartney honed these perfect little tunes and they were just great songwriters. So, and then, you know, they go through the different eras and they keep expanding, keep trying different things. And so the Beatles are just never boring across their entire journey. So I, I like that you say that because it gives me some perspective because, and I'm not throwing shade just to throw it, <laughs> right? Um, you never. I get why people like them. It's very listenable music. I, you know, sure. undeniably, right? That's not, and that's not, not the greatest compliment in the world lots of people can make, listenable music. What I don't get is why 6.5 out of 7 billion people, it's their favorite band. Right? Or their favorite music. Not, fuck bands. They wouldn't even consider them a band. It's my favorite music. I, it's like, I, I get why people like it. I just don't get why people love them above everyone else. I think you're, you, you've presented some interesting uh, analysis of that. And I'm coming at it from someone who is a big music fan and... I don't want to call myself an insider, but I'm interested in things like... But you and Rick how, Rubin are having lunch tomorrow. Yeah, you know, well, you know. At his Malibu house, we're having kale. I'm interested in the idea of, like, why is this this great the fingerprint of like these songwriters versus this songwriter and why why is it when they write a song this way it sounds like that why is it when they do like all of that kind of music geek nuts and bolts kind of stuff and the Beatles are just filled with that and then you can you can dig into the rarities you can dig into there's an album that just has like the, a lot of in between stuff when they're in the studio so you can hear them working things out you hear him fuck up chords, and that's great. You know, it's like George Harrison's this revered musician, but then you hear him strum a wrong chord, and he's like, "Oh shit, um, oh." And it's just, it's, it's great. I get what you're saying, but I, at the end of the day, they just don't boil my water, homie. All right. So you know, there's that old adage: Are you a Beatles man or are you an Elvis man? You can I, like both, but you gotta love one well, or the other. I've heard that about the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and then the Beatles, Beatles and Elvis. And I guess I'd be an Elvis guy. Although the, that very concept angers me to my core. But, you know. but if I had to, if you ask me to choose, I'll choose Elvis. I do, and I like Elvis. I think Elvis I like is interesting. Elvis a lot. But the, this, is that, this is that whole adage, like you can't wear the band shirt to the thing. It's like, yeah, go fuck it's, yourself. I can do whatever I want. Do whatever the hell you want. But the thing, the, 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 the thing is that, um, it's just like, yeah, no one questions the Beatles. In the, and it's like, the personification of this is Beatles mania, which is an exception that proves the rule of snarkiness. Like, if any band, any band came 
that close to that level of fandom, they'd be hated, burn at the stake for it, right? And I, and it's just weird. Like, like we were, we're, oh my God, Beatlemania, how amazing was that? That does not sound amazing to me. That sounds fucking weird. That girls are begging, uh, they're fainting at the sight of people, that they're, they're screaming hysterically, that you can't even hear the music because they're just going, going nuts. nuts. It sounds like, it sounds like the the revelation of some terrible cultural like fucking <laughs> something buried away and sleeping. You know what I mean? I I completely agree with you. Some of those images, like if you take them out of context, you could say like, oh yeah, this was World War Two or this yeah, this Hanoi. is this is seeing <laughs> seeing the footage of yeah of, of fucking the this Battle is of the Bulls. day JFK was shot. Yeah, it's exactly. Like, you can totally just say like that's what it look. It looks like it could right. be in a Ken Burns documentary. It's like r- repressed repressed female. Fucking everything, you know what I mean? But yeah, it's and that's that's kind of the idea. You got to think of the time where it's, you know, Lemmy talks about. I remember a time when there was no rock and roll, right? And so it's like this was everything they wanted that they could never have. That maybe Elvis was a little too risque for their house. They didn't listen to Elvis, but then you got these four nicely dressed boys who were just cute and were charming, and then like that's what you go crazy over. And it's it's just all that repression is just. Boosh, right, right out there. Right, repression is a great word. Yep. And then this this all sowed the seed for bubblegum pop music. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Which is a uh, another terrible trend from our collective childhood. <laughs> that was awful. Like yummy, yummy, yummy. I got love in my tummy. No, I'm not gonna like fucking in sync and the Backstreet oh, Boys yeah, yeah, yeah. and Britney Spears. I mean, it's, you see that, that era. Yeah, that level of fandom. I feel like we didn't even really see it again until that happened. You know? I mean. Yeah, and, like and maybe Nirvana, but not not on that level. I mean, because Sinatra was the first like teenage act. You know what I mean? Like yeah. Sinatra was the first like you know the Bobby Soxers all loved him. He was like a teen scream kind of thing before even the concept of a teenager was really a thing. Mm-hmm. But these are the first. This is the first boy band, and yeah. to their credit, they're like actually talented musicians. But like, um, you know, I mean, the 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 fruit that this bear is just some some awful times. Absolutely. I completely agree. So, uh, as of this recording, you can find this movie on Netflix, Amazon, iTunes, and Vudu. We're going to get into this movie in one minute now that we've blabbered about the Beatles. Anything else you want to say about the Beatles? Uh, Ringo Forever? I have seen Paul McCartney live. He is incredible. I recommend seeing him anytime. Seven years old, still fucking doing it. Played a three hour show. I'd say like 70% Beatles music. All his other songs. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. He played a time Beatles. He, he can. He wrote all those songs. How, did he take Ringo on tour? Ringo's still alive, right? Yeah, Ringo is still alive. He does not take Ringo on tour. Come he's on. kind of he's got his own little band. Whatever drummer he has is great. It's this big Samoan dude, and he is fantastic. He's a great drummer. Uh, yeah, he played for three hours and looked like he could have gone three more. Wow! Like he didn't even look like the least bit like oh like you know you see like Metallica or um, Nick Cave or somebody like that live, and they just look spent they have put all of their energy out yeah there's nothing like, left yeah, there's nothing left paul mccarty looked like comb his hair a little bit maybe get a drink of water and he could have played three more hours do you regret not going to old cella i was out of town when it happened and i would have liked to have gone that being said i've seen a lot of the bands from there i've seen the rolling stones i've seen neil young i've seen paul mccartney um, the Who are kind of a shell of their former self. Ooh, shit on the Who. There are only two of them alive anymore. And um, it's not even the two interesting ones. Um, Roger Waters, I'm kind of indifferent towards. I'm not the world's biggest Pink Floyd fan, although I do like a lot of their stuff. And then um, same with Bob Dylan. I've heard he's hit and miss live, so it's sort of a uh, don't really need to see him. Mm. But it would have been fun just to go for the atmosphere. So, so what are your expectations? So, for as much as I love the Beatles, I almost have no interest in hearing about the Beatles story again. I feel like we know it. It's been hammered in so many books, movies, TV specials. It's like, I know the damn story of the damn Beatles, you know. But, the only thing that interests me in this is that it's coming from somebody who was right there with them. And who is still alive and who can recount it. It's not something that somebody told a rock journalist and then he framed it in a way it's like this woman was there saw it all from the ground up so she's gonna have a much more interesting perspective on it so i feel like this is this could be like the definitive beatles document 
Um, I want to be moved to listen to them. I want to be inspired to, to take an interest. And I want someone to not, like, justify it all to me, but, like, yeah. just kind of get me into it. You know, I want... I want an evocation. You know what I mean? I want to be I want to be evoked into caring. And uh, documentaries have the power to do such a thing. So yes, do. I don't think that's asking too much. Internet. I want you to be a screaming mess. Yeah, I want to. I just want to just want to cry my heart out. <laughs> All right, a screaming mess. So let's get into this. Let's do right it right now. Here we go. We're back. We're back. Kev, how'd you watch it? Netflix streaming. Watched half at work on my lunch break. Finished it when I got home. Watched it on Netflix, on this couch. Netflix. Great. Use offer code. No, that should be their, their tagline. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Netflix. Yes. Um, what did we think of the story of good old Frida? This is a good story. She's such an interesting personality to carry us through the narrative of the Beatles. Mm -hmm. Because she is highly unassuming and is very, very British, very polite, doesn't want to toot her own horn, but like was there at ground zero of one of the biggest musical explosions that ever happened, you know, and had firsthand knowledge of the entire story of the Beatles, basically. And I really did like the way the documentary kind of keeps that tone through the whole film. It never gets too high or too low of like super high, like, oh my God, they're huge and famous and super low. Like, oh, they're breaking up. John Lennon's divorcing his wife. Where It's like, it kind of keeps that good British even keel about it. And it really is ultimately... A story about her it's not just the Beatles story through her eyes it is it is her story and she just happened to have this extraordinary 10 years in her life and it, you know now she's just some office worker in Britain and you know doesn't didn't become like a rock and roll lifer just lives kind of this unassuming life and and interesting that at the end they reveal that she's never really told anybody about this, has never really documented it in any kind of way in that, and she's I'm never going to tell it again. This is the document of my time with the Beatles. So I thought it was a very good little film. Um, so I think, as a, I think this movie, as a non-fan, is a bit thin. It's pleasant, but it's like a rice cake. It doesn't fill you up. And that's not to say, like, Frida's very charming, especially in the first half of the movie. But I don't think her charm, it can't hold up what's not there. I mean, you found her charming. We both found her charming. Yeah. That's, not, that's not a debate. I'll agree with but that. But I feel like, she, you know, she hasn't told her story of her. She didn't tell much of a story. I mean, she told about how she got involved with them in the beginning. And then she told some, de- there's some interesting details about, you know how she ran the place, right? As the secretary and her interactions with, like, their, their manager, producer, whoever that guy was. Brian Epstein. He was their manager. Right. But there wasn't any... I mean, and listen, I get that if you don't want to tell... And I get that if you want privacy. I'm not against that. But it's like, there, there, she wouldn't... There was very little information going out there. I feel like everything was front-loaded in this movie is the front half. And then, I mean, listen, I mean, they, her son died, and I get that she doesn't want to talk about that, you know? But it's kind of like... As an uh, as an art object, which a film is, it feels lacking if no one talks about that, right? And I get I, and I, I, and listen, if she doesn't want to talk about that, that's cool. But then don't make it. I don't. I don't want to see a documentary about it because there's just not enough there. You know what I mean? And like, I don't know. It's like why no one. I feel like no one was willing to ask her any questions, or maybe they asked her and she didn't answer. But it's like, why didn't you try to be like Ringo's secretary after Ringo? You know, when they all did their separate things, why did you? Why did you get away from them? Was that invitation not there? It seemed like there wasn't... I don't know. It felt very amateur in that way of like... It seemed to not be any follow-up on anything. I really didn't like this movie. Okay. I will agree that... I won't ever put this in the pantheon of great rock documentaries. Which are stacked with good filmmaking and those incisive moments that you're looking for. Yes. But I think it just... It does paint 
a unique story of a story that's been told a million times and a half. And it's just, to limit it to just her perspective, I thought, is an interesting move. Now, will she not divulge certain things? That's fine. There's mystery in rock and roll. And there's always going to be those untold stories of like, you know, did she have an affair with any of them? And she kind of hints she had the hots for one or two of them. Or four of them. Or, I think, or all four of them. Uh, also, yeah. She kind of bounced around. Whoever at, whoever treated her nice that day. Mm-hmm. And I respect that she didn't want to have other friends. I respect that. I like, what, a, I like when she said, oh, John Lennon with his that Roman nose. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and it's a cool angle, right? It's a cool angle. She's like, I'm not going to do it. But someone has to be grilling the steak, homie. Someone has to be grilling the steak. Because there's a difference between mystery and nothing. And I feel like... That's, this that's a very fine line to toe of like, just use your imagination, man. It's like, no, give me... I need some shit. Yeah. So... And I, I just I think... Agree. And I, I think the lack of inclusion of Beatles people really hurts this movie. The fact that Ringo does a cameo at the end and there's no Paul, that doesn't look good. That's not a good look for the movie. Yeah, that's a good point. Actually. You know? And it's like, and I like how they interviewed some other bands of the era, which I liked a lot. And I like those interviews a lot. Yeah, they got, um... The four somethings? Uh, sorry, I was thinking, I watched another documentary here. <laughs> I was watching... They had, uh, White Snake and... I was, I was and... thinking about the birds, and then, but that was a different documentary I was watching, mm-hmm. so... And I mean, maybe, and maybe because it's already been done to death that they didn't include other people, producers, fans, people she worked with. You know what I mean? Um, but I don't know. I, I feel like it really lacked, and there was times in the movie where it's like, okay, this could have yeah. been this could have been chopped up into like a Vice twenty minute piece. I feel like I could buy that too. Actually, it might, but I think. I just like the idea of someone who got in on the ground floor on complete fucking accident, mm-hmm. basically. Which, when you read a lot of rock and roll stories and do that, a lot of stuff does kind of happen on accident. It's like, he just so happened to be their fan club manager, and this band just happened to be huge, and they needed a secretary and they hired you. It's like, you can't apply for that position. It just happens, you know? It's just You are there at a moment in time that... It could never happen any other way. And I just... I like that angle of it. Now, is it as incisive a documentary as we could have had? Is it as informative of... Is it going to make any new Beatles fans? I don't think so. No. Yeah, I don't think it... It doesn't go far enough in that respect. But I think that's their goal, though. I think it's supposed to be kind of small. I think they're supposed to only... They only... They don't need to hear... You know, they want to hear what she says, what um, Ringo's mom says. It's like the people that were kind I of like that. I like on that. the outside of it. You know, people that she kind of worked with. It's not, you know, if Brian Epstein was still alive, it's like they probably wouldn't have even interviewed him for this. It's like they want to see what were the regular working stiffs in Beatles Incorporated. How did they see this timeless music story? basically. And I think, I think the filmmakers are really trying to do that and they stick to that line. I just wish that it was, I mean, there's, uh, I just feel like a lot of it, like they don't tell anyone's ages until like halfway through the movie. Right. And she's like, Oh, I I dropped out of high school. And it's like, why? You know what I mean? It's like, just, just the little things of like, not people don't tend to drop out of high school. So Mm -hmm. because you had a bad home life, because at that time everyone was feeling down, it was the sixties. Like what, like because you, you live you in wanted, Liverpool, which is a fucking hard scrabble town, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, exactly. Like, I just wanted like just like I feel like there's so it's like you know why? It's like I don't know why. I don't know anything about any of this shit. And then there's the thing is I I think Roger Ebert said like a good documentary should be able to play to someone who doesn't know anything about the topic. Mm-hmm. And I don't think that that did because I'm like uh like when it's like oh yeah the Beatles were like 20. I'm like they were 20 when this all happened. Yeah. Also the Beatles were only around. I had a lot of takeaways, a lot of takeaways and questions. So you, you learned things from this. Well, we'll get to it. But <laughs> Beatlemania and the Beatles were very short lived. They broke up in the 70s. I didn't know that. Yep. They only toured for like four or five years. Mm-hmm. And their last years were all in the studio. They didn't play any live shows. And, and no one and no one talked. I mean no one in this documentary is talk. I mean I guess because everyone already knew knows. But it's like. Like that, I think that's interesting. That you know, it's like they're still the most popular band in the world, even though they've they're starting to fall apart. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Also, so also, 
So and this and is kind of privately falling apart too. They didn't well, really. But, but it's unusual for a band not to tour. Oh, it's completely unusual. Yeah, I right? mean, you you only someone with the clout of the Beatles could just say we're not going to tour. Like that's where bands make their bread and butter. Mm-hmm. You know. Also, do we believe? I'm sure there's a documentary about this, but it, the 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 word on the street is that Yoko Ono broke up the Beatles. That's not true, right? I mean, that's a very you can pinpoint her showing up as the start of the real breakdown when you because it's was she the sole responsibility for breaking up the Beatles? No. Well, if you say Yoko Ono broke up the Beatles by implication of that, those words, that, that is what you're saying. Yeah. that's wrong. Right. But there, are, she was kind of a catalyst to a lot of different things and like drove a wedge between you know did she personally do it? I don't know, but. It starts with, like, John Lennon starting to take input from her as opposed to Paul when it comes to writing a song. And obviously that's going to drive a wedge. Um, Ringo, but, but, that's Ringo a, but that's a choice, though, right? That's a choice. He chose, like, hey, exactly. the guy who I'm in the fucking band with, I don't give a shit what he thinks about anymore. I want to listen exactly. to this girl. That's his choice. And I feel like people, they're like, oh, yeah, she did that. It's like, you can't just do, you can't just control people. You know, like, I could be like, Kev, you should blankety, stop eating meat. You have to choose to listen to me. Exactly. Right? You're not gonna. Now, again, there's that level of was he choosing to listen to Yoko because she was telling him that, oh yeah, you're the most talented and Paul's like, he only ever wrote Yesterday, you know, which is literally a song lyric that they have. And um, so it, there's that level. Again, nobody was there that's really alive to tell the tale and the people that are alive aren't telling the story. Right. Because it's it's just that personal. Like, and it's, you know, like you have with any friend. It's you have ebbs and flows. And, you know, these guys were friends since they were kids and maybe didn't spend a lot of time away from each other in that whirlwind time of the Beatles. Like, and that'll, that'll strain you a little bit. And that's also another thing with these, especially with these bands that, that have um, gone on forever. It's like with any relationship, right? Like, why do people stop hanging out or break up or whatever? It's because you change in different ways mm-hmm. away from each other, right? So it's like, you know, if they all go to India and they all dig the Indian culture. Which but, Ringo did not. Right. So Ringo flew back. Apparently he didn't like the food. But he also didn't dig. Fucking Ringo. What a baby. Like the Fucking drug. baby Ringo. Like the Can't whole. handle the heat. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he didn't really like the direction the band was going. So he just he was just kind of there. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's like if you got four guys and they're not all on the same page, there's going to be friction. This is why I say Slipknot is the most... How how can they... How can it ever happen that way, right? Slipknot, yep. nine dudes from Iowa wearing masks, coming out with a sound in a new metal era which has been summarily dismissed by all of music, right? And that's the band that... That made it. That, that plays shows to 100,000 people. Yep. They still found a way. Right. Now, they've replaced some members. Well, they, but they're well, only... The one guy died. One guy died, and, and then the other has, like, a disease. Jordan right. Jordan disease. Yeah, he had some sort of disease. He could, literally could not play the drums, and they're yeah. like, hey, but we like, have yeah, to keep going. The core of that band is just there, you know? Mm-hmm. Somehow they made it work. That's what I'm saying. That, yeah, that how, is... how, it's hard enough to juggle, like, as we're going to see down the road with the White Stripes, it's hard enough to juggle two personalities. Right. Band. Nine. Nine personalities? Nine. Rotating, and, like, with their tour production they have? Insane. I I just hope that one day that story they're given the credit for just for merely existing. Exactly. Yeah. Just nine dudes playing insane music in masks, and they're selling arenas out. Yeah. It's incredible. Right. How does it happen? How does that happen? Um, Billy from the Foremost. That's the band I was trying to think of. The okay. Foremost. Nobody knew what they'd become, and if you say you did, you're a liar. I I, I appreciate that because like, especially something with that where there's n- never been anything like it. You know, it's like. Well, bands that played the Cavern Club, the Cavern Club was like a shithole in Liverpool. Oh, oh by the way, know. the Cavern Club, what a great name for an underground thing, what, what it is. Cool concept. That place looked like it was dirty and smelly. Yep. Also, also speaking I, of... I guarantee you it got sweaty in there. And, and, and just in terms of my questions for this, they're playing lunch shows? What, where, what fucking city has lunch rock and roll shows? The kind of city I want to live in. I know, right? Like, can I, what what is that? I'm not gonna watch, you know, Black Mirror on my lunch break. I'm gonna go see a rock show. That'd be badass. That's weird. 
That was weird. I was like, wait, they played lunch shows? That's how they got their fame? And everyone showed up to a lunch show? That's great. That's hey, hey, Lemmy was there a couple times. So yeah. Good good on Lemmy. I mean, I get why Lemmy was there, because Lemmy was just doing drugs in fucking, you know... Fucking around Liverpool. <laughs> yeah, being a roadie. You know, he had plenty of time, but like... Yeah. Oh, hold on, I gotta... Let me clock out real quick. I'm gonna go yeah. get a, catch a show. Go see a concert. And, yeah. But yeah, I, I like how the guy from the foremost said that. Because I, I think that a lot of people were like, oh yeah. Like, with anyone who's really, it's like, you, we just knew that they were going to be in sync. That's, that's never the, true. It's the narrative every time you watch any number of band documentaries. And yeah, it's the like, you just knew these guys were going to be special, you know? It's like, nobody said that. It's just, because you, they play a, rev, a review where there were like five bands and they were all shitty and you just lumped them in with all the shitty bands you saw. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But yeah, but then they got famous. Like, oh yeah, I saw them at their high school talent show. You didn't know shit. Yeah, my cousin says that he uh, he was friends with the Green Day. It's like you were friends with some weirdo punk guys. They were yeah. not Green Day. They were not Green Day. We're, yeah, every punk in the Bay Area was Green Day. <laughs> Just like Tony Hawk, people will be like, Tony, do you, do you recognize me? Oh yeah, it's it's Steve. Being famous must suck. <laughs> we, went to, we went to Fort Lauderdale <laughs> High School together. Like we were like best friends. No, we didn't. Like, like it's like well, yeah, your I name was. Uh, your I name had was... one class with you. Yeah, <laughs> or or no class. I didn't we grow up in Fort, yeah. Fort Lauderdale. You could visit me with some other kid. Yeah, exactly. Um, why'd you, why'd you change your name, to Tony Hawk? Yeah, yeah. You were like you know John Dixon. <laughs> That's weird. <laughs> Change your race too. Uh, Beatles in leather, le- wearing leather jackets. What is this? That was their original image. They were kind of this like greaser band. Mm-hmm. Also, like, Chelsea like, boots, tight. Chelsea boots looking good. Um, but yeah, it was like I believe it was Epstein who just like put a suit on. Let's all get the same haircut. We're gonna have like this clean cut image. Interesting. You know? And what's funny is they come out of Liverpool, which is like this really hard scrabble town. And they're like supposedly the clean cut take home take home to mom band, you know. And the Rolling Stones are like the evil band and the scary guys. They grew up in like the London suburbs, you know. They they were living an okay life, so it, it's just funny that that dichotomy happened between those two bands. Which is so weird because I, I I'm not I'm not throwing dispersions, but the the Beatles music is so especially that early stuff is so, to my knowledge, like fun in the sun, like kind of. You know, hold my, I want to hold your hand, kind of shit, right? Yeah. But then Lemmy has a story about how uh, someone was talking shit to to Paul, uh, John Lennon, and he just went over and kicked the dude, <laughs> like and he well, he's fucked him up, and then he went by playing a song about love. And some they don't really talk about in this movie, and what you might be looking for in a Beatles story. Yeah. John Lennon was kind of a violent person. Interesting. He is a hot temper. He was a known woman beater. Oh no, really. He can, he couldn't imagine the people. Not every day he couldn't. So weird. Maybe maybe that's the Beatles story you're looking for. I mean so. that's a I mean I wouldn't want to. Frida's not gonna divulge that. I mean I I like my stories to be more like quirky, not like super dark. Oh, yeah. I'm well, not I mean, looking. There's definitely some. I like the dirt, like you know, uh, you know, like you know, you know, Ringo. You know, if if uh, you know, if, if uh, someone said Ringo, just go. Why don't you go over there and just you know fucking drink a, you know, I don't know, do something weird. You know, it's like, you know, like Ringo could never say no to jumping off a roof. You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> what? Like, I want that weird shit, like the stupid I mean, stuff. They were all in the same room when George Harrison lost his virginity. And then when he finished, they all clapped. And they said, yay, George! <laughs> there, uh... I There's like, some Beatles stories out there. I feel like, especially... I mean, I guess maybe England in the 60s was just a weird place. I mean, you know... <laughs> A lot of uh, a lot of different things going on, working class and posh and counterculture. And and also, I think rock you know, and roll coming over from America, and the young kids really latching onto that, which was in a direct front to their parents who listened to folk music. You know, that's why that's where Led Zeppelin, Rolling Stones, Beatles all came from. Mm-hmm. It's just this they they latched on to American Southern black music. Yeah, and just made it their own. So. Yeah. So I, maybe that's why we're having such a different opinion of this because I feel like I know so much about the Beatles part and it's like I don't need to hear the cradle to the grave story of the Beatles ever again. So it's cool for me to see a totally different perspective of that. But, but you, you find boring? Not necessarily, and I wouldn't call it boring. I mean, maybe you're... Was it completely but... turned my eyes glued, compelling documentary? Eh, no. 
Mm-hmm. I've seen better, of course. But as a Beatles fan, as someone who's interested in them, I think it's a, a good perspective on what we usually get when it comes to the Beatles. Like that Ron Howard documentary that just came out, I have no interest in watching that whatsoever. Well, what's that about, though? It's about their touring years. Mm. So he focuses it on like those four or five years where they actually toured. I don't care. I, I feel like I know that story. I and mean, I've heard it, and it's been beaten into the ground. And what what new can be gleaned from it? So. Well, it's weird. Did they just like playing together because they were the Beatles? I mean, there were a lot of things. Yeah, in it too, so. I, I mean, I'll, I'll watch a different documentary. That's, for, uh, that's for a whole other discussion. My last question is, do people still write in for autographs? I think if I do. send my autograph book to Ghost, you'd will a, they... You'd be amazed how many people still really hound for autographs, especially in a day of eBay where a lot of people... In fact, they're starting to restrict people on this. You know, Henry Rollins talked about at signings, guys will have just stacks of shit that they want him to sign. And he's like, I know you're just going to sell this on fucking eBay. It's like, it, this should mean something to you. It's like, And that's why they have to limit... You know, if you go to Amoeba, it's like they'll sign... The album you buy and one other thing, and that's it. You know. Well, and I get like, uh, cause I, I went, you ever gone to the Paley Fest? No. So it's just like a, it's like a Comic Con panel, but you know, not at Comic Con. Uh-huh. Um, and some of them are fucking rough. The the Q and As are rough. Yep. But afterwards they'll do autographs, right? And me and Emily are just like, okay, we're fucking, you know, we're, we're gonna yeah. fuck off. But goddamn, dude, like, there's people who run up there, they just bulldoze their way to the front, and they're, like, signed, and it's, like, 50 of the same poster, and it's, like, yeah, dude, of course you're just gonna turn these around, right? Because yeah. why do you, why would you need more than one of this? Exactly. I get, I get why you'd need two, one to rock and one to stock, yeah. right? But, like, if, if someone had, like, if someone's getting an autograph from Gimbal to Tour and they have all of his things on Blu-ray, I get that, you just want all of your things signed. But if you have 20 copies of Pan Lab- Pan's Labyrinth, it's, like, come on. Yeah. Bullshit. Yeah, it's, you know you're just going to be hawking those. But yeah, there is, there's still people that clamor for sports stars, autographs, movie stars, everything. Baseball so, cards. Baseball cards. Baseball cards are still a thing, so. Yeah, digital baseball cards. Yeah. So yeah, there probably is, uh, if you can't sign in, have something personally signed, you can find it on eBay, you know. Is, did anything not work? For you. We know it didn't work for me. I feel like I like the tone of the second half where it's kind of that that slow breakdown of how like everything's kind of just starting to starting to crack at the seams. I do feel like her being so cagey about a lot of her personal details keeps us at a distance from her. Yeah. And like if you know, okay, her son died. How old was he? How did he die? Was it an accident? Was it a medical thing? You know, it's and how, like, how we never how act- do you ever recover from that? Like that, me as a humanist, I want to hear that human story. Right, exactly. And so I get that you don't want to talk about it, but as this is a study of the human condition, I need I'm naturally curious, and especially a documentary that really is about you more than it is about the Beatles. It's like we do want to know. You know, the one story that they do get that I think is really good is when she wants to move to London. Her dad tells her no. And then, like, Brian Epstein has to talk talk to her dad. Like, to hear hear her reminisce about how he said, you know, your daughter is very smart. She's very good. She will be fine in London. You know, to, like, to see a guy who's this big rock and roll manager personality do something of that caliber is really cool. And, like, those kind of stories really show you what kind of life she had, who she is, and the people around her. But, yeah, she gets a little cagey with too many details. And, yeah, it's like we're here to get the story. And, like, maybe we come in because we want a Beatles story, but we leave even more moved because we heard your story. You know? So, yeah, I think... I, 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 I'm right there with you. I, it could have... There could have been moments where it went that far. I have no nitpicks for this movie. Do you have any nitpicks? Not really. Yeah. Any? Uh, the only the only cool thing I want to just point out is that this movie does have a great soundtrack. Oh yeah. Um, not only just Beatles songs, but covers of Beatles songs. Right. And then rock and roll songs, songs of the era. It's yeah. just yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah. Um. In the end, would you say that you like this movie and does it work? I do like it. It does work. 
I know in the first half I said I kind of want a new perspective on the Beatles, and I think I kind of got that. But I really wanted a little bit more, mm. you know. And I want to know more about her too. She seems like a perfectly charming person who has lived an interesting life for the most part, or at least this ten-year chunk of her life is certainly very interesting. So, you know, maybe it, it didn't quite go as far as it could have. If a seasoned old rock and roll documentary vet had made this thing, I bet he could have gotten that out of her. Uh, I don't like this movie. I don't think it really works. I think if you're a Beatles fan, like a really hardcore Beatles fan, it's a good completionist kind of a yeah a thing. Definitely, but... if you own the Beatles Anthology 3, which is a bunch of studio outtakes both versions of the Let It Be album. It's like, this is just one more thing to add to your Beatles. If you got Beatles in mono, this is for you. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. But, you know, um, and it, I will say, it does humanize the Fab Four, as I've learned they're called. Fab Four. Uh, in, in the sense of it's a story about going from nothing to something, you know what I mean? But I just think that, in the end, it's a disappointment. Now, my crazy fan theory for this, and not this is not a crazy fan theory, but this is just something that you think about. She fucked them all, didn't she? Oh, all no. four of them. I all at once. I, I, <laughs> in I, the Cavern Club. I don't think all four at once, but <laughs> probably two of them. That's what I was going to say about uh, That's what I was going to say about Ringo, but I didn't want to go to that place. But here we are. <laughs> you know, Ringo, he just, you know, him and a buddy, you know, all consensual, mind you. But, uh, yeah, he, get, uh, he, he, he was a fan of the Devil's Threesome. So... <laughs> They were over as a band, right? Uh-huh. And but in the truest, like they were, they were over as a band, obviously. But they were also all individually over, and I don't think people really understand that. Like a lots of lots of bands are over, like people like Tool and people like Metallica and people. Tool's like, making that album, damn it! Yeah, right. Metallica's new album comes out. No, in no, two no, weeks. no, no. They're over. They're over. They're like over, like pro wrestling over. Like they're people are like. New Metallica album, I'm there. It doesn't uh, matter what. It doesn't matter. I'll be there. I thought you said over as in like... No, 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 no. Over as in gotten over with the crowd. I forget that... Uh, professional wrestling uh, part line. Professional lines. wrestling for all things. Yeah, yeah. indeed. <laughs> That's my tombstone will read one day. Um, but the members of a band are not always over in the same way, right? Like, you know, Kiss is the best example. Kiss is a band. People would fucking just kiss on me, baby. Mwah! Those solar albums, no one gave a fuck, right? Ace Freely's is good, but yeah, that was a that was a very expensive failure, right? For Kiss. So that's the interesting thing about the Beatles is that even you know, you know, Paul and John are like the stars of the show, right? But people are fucking into Ringo still, you know. People, and George Harrison's solo albums are brilliant. He's a brilliant songwriter, right? And I don't think that's just you. I don't think it's an isolated opinion. I think a lot of people think that kind of stuff, yeah. right? So it's interesting because like you know, you look at. Um, like, you know, like the fucking lead singer of uh, System of a Down had a solo album. People, those who liked it, liked it. Yeah. But it didn't light the world on fire. It's just interesting that, that more than probably yeah, any band Surge in the world... Search Tanking isn't thought of as a solo artist. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, the lead singer of System of a Down has, had, had a has, solo has a couple solo albums. That's cool. cool. But yeah, it's always tied back to that. Right. Now, Paul McCartney has gone and kind of made a name for yeah, himself. Yeah, indeed. I mean, he had Wings after it, and then his solo albums, and now... Now he's a must-see stadium act at the ripe young age of 70. Right. That's what I'm saying. It's like, who? what other bands... I'm sure there's some bands who have similar success, like, of, of everyone who's able to, to do something, but, like, I would say, not like this. About the only thing I compared to is maybe Morrissey. You know, the Smiths were huge, but he is still... But the Smiths, the rest of the Smiths didn't... Uh, Johnny Marr keeps busy. Yeah, so. but I mean, not... But he, he ain't selling out at fucking the Sable Center. No. He, yeah, you couldn't put Johnny Marr. Johnny Marr could sell out a small club, and that's probably it. Yeah, so it's just really interesting that, and like... And then they'd be like, oh, play, play uh, Meat is Murder, you know? <laughs> uh, but that's the thing, is that... Uh, I just think it's interesting how that all... That... How they are just... You can't take it away. Like, like you, maybe I don't love their, their music sonically. You know, maybe I will eventually one day when I get into it. I think I like the early stuff better. But the, the point is, is they're popular in a way that nothing else is popular. Uh-huh. Music, like, as a band. And that's interesting. And, and, and their songs, still timeless to this day. Still expensive to this day <laughs> to get a Beatles song, which mm. is impressive. So, in terms of if you want to license it for something, it's like you got to pony up. You know, it's like those have not depreciated value whatsoever. Yeah. 
You gotta sell some uh, Apple computers and some BMWs. I mean, Ringo probably did those Skechers commercials because he's bored. Did you know Ringo was in Skechers commercials? I mean... Uh, too recently. I They're mean, good commercials. He's just like the comfy shoes. Skechers, I play my drums in them. Uh, and they're trying to rebrand themselves Skechers. Skechers, I, in my eyes, will never recover, but, you know, whatever. I like mine. What? Like You've seen my Skechers. Oh, 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 oh yeah, yeah. I like Skechers. Nah, not no problem. <laughs> whatever. I'm not cool. Well, hey, we didn't come here to talk about <laughs> Skechers shoes, right? Uh, anything else you want to you wanna add about the Beatles? Um, I do recommend everybody dig into their discography. Don't just listen to the hits, although the hits are plentiful and good. They have a lot of good B-sides, and if you really want to learn the craft of songwriting or want to study it more, those songs are perfect to dig into because they really do interesting things with chord structures and notes and the way things play off each other. It's McCartney and Lennon were very smart songwriters. I'm going to check out the early 60s stuff. I'm going to check it out. I'm also... I mean, they're oh. really sad. that that is their early stuff. It's early sixties. Yeah, are you talking about late sixties? Because you said you you like their early stuff better. No, I don't like any. I don't. I'm not familiar with any of it. Okay. So I'm gonna there start. I'm gonna I'm gonna I mean, try yeah. to definitely start. Take the journey. Mm. Start from the first album and go to the end. But I'm gonna say it's not to the credit of this fucking movie. <laughs> don't take no credit, Frida. It's from our conversation. So, <laughs> Paul McCartney, you owe Kevin one no. Coke. Uh, and I'll also say it's interesting that no one in recent times they've ever tried to rip off the Beatles in terms of doing like a harmony kind of a sound and how come bands don't play in suits anymore let's get some suits gentlemen yeah I'd like to see I mean the Mighty Mighty Boss Stones they the, did it the Hives they play in suits yeah or uniforms yeah I would like to see I've always said a really heavy band with vocal harmonies would be cool mm -hmm. some bands dabble into it like Metallica's got some good harmonies on their new some one of their new songs but yeah it's like I want to see like that really be a structure of the band yeah. you know Big fat heavy power chords with like really nice vocal harmonies. Mm -hmm. I'm with you. Do it. I'm with you. And wear a suit. And that's it for this episode. Thanks for listening to our conversation. Come back and join us on our next episode. This episode written by Jeffrey Dapper. Music by Jeff Russell. We are Speaking Cinema. You are the listeners. You be you. See you next time. Let it.